Upgrade your game day with Team Toyota. Headed to the practice fields or the stadium, we have a great selection of new trucks and SUVs to choose from. And with our lineup of over 200 certified used Toyotas, you can find the right fit for you or for your budget. 75 used cars under 20K. Don't get stuck on the sidelines. Our service centers are here to get you back on the road in no time. Visit one of our three locations in Princeton, Langhorne, or Glen Mills, or online at teamtoyota.net. Hey folks, thanks for checking out the Phillies Talk Podcast. I am Corey Seidman, he's Spencer McKercher. We're checking in with you here on November 15th, the middle of November. Uh, free agency has been underway for a couple of weeks now, but in baseball, it's not nearly as quick. It doesn't, uh, things, the big things don't happen nearly as fast as they do in the NBA or the NFL. You know, the, the, the notable free agents, the Wansos of the world, they're still uh, weeks away from signing, you would think, probably at least before the winter meetings that second week of December. But uh, the Phillies have not done anything yet, kind of to be expected. You're not going to make any big moves this early in the offseason as you're waiting for things to play out. But there have been a lot of rumors, Spence. Uh, I think we've been talking all along this offseason that we expected a trade to happen just because the free agent market didn't like naturally align with the Phillies' needs outside of Soto. And the more that you hear these rumblings coming out nationally and locally, it sure sounds like the Phillies could be in the – a trade could be in the works, a trade of a notable player. Exactly. And – Obviously, the big notable player that we're talking about is Alec Bohm. And, you know, we were talking to some people here as the season kind of came to an end. Um, and it was almost like it's not a given, but there was a chance. Um, and now all you hear, you know, you hear these national outlets talking about Bohm is on the trading block. Um, I saw Buster Olney say something that he is going to be traded. Um, it's interesting. And like you said, we talked about this on the previous few pods, just kind of, you know, the free agents that they that are available right now. You know, not too many, maybe a bullpen arm, maybe a fifth starter down the road. Um, but when it comes down to some trading, to trading some players, you know, we could see Alec Bohm. We could see Brandon Marsh. We could see Johan Ross. We could see anybody. Um, so now, uh, dude, one of my favorite times of the year here uh, as we get the rumors. <laughs> the rumors are rolling in, man. It's uh, like you said, November 15th here and the uh, the hot stove starting to warm up a little bit. And it's not like the Phillies want to go out and trade one of these young players. I mean, they just see it as a way to kind of, you know, fill out their roster and and upgrade other places because this is the, the the problem is that the Phillies obviously need at least one outfielder, maybe two outfielders, right? Yeah. But in free agency, after Juan Soto, there's nothing out there in center field. So Soto doesn't play center, but in terms of center field, there's nothing out there in center field. There's Harrison Bader. And then after that, you're looking at like Michael A. Taylor. You're looking at players who aren't even as good as Johan Rojas. So upgrading in center field and free agency seems somewhat unrealistic. And then in a corner outfield spot, there's Soto, yes. There's Tyler O'Neill. And then after that, you're looking at like Jurickson Profar, Anthony Santander, Teoscar Hernandez. Santander and Teoscar Hernandez, by the way, uh, were given qualifying offers. So if the Phillies right. were to sign one of those two guys, cost them a draft pick. That's that's a big consideration for a team that wants to you know continue to stockpile in the minor leagues to be able to contend for years to come. So that's why you start to explore uh, maybe a Bohm trade, maybe a Ranger Suarez trade, a Brandon Marsh trade, see what it nets you. I mean, I don't think Marsh is likely because they still need outfield and he plays right. outfield. Um, and the Bohm thing, I think, what we're hearing, what we're you know seeing that the, the tea leaves around the league is, you know maybe they could trade Bohm and uh, sign Alex Bregman, who's a free agent. Alex Be Bregman's probably the second best position player on the market after Soto. He's played third base mostly his entire career with the Astros, but he can also play second. He can also play short. But I think if the Phillies were to sign him, it would probably be to play third base. And you know if that's the idea probably want to trade Bohm first because if you sign a player like Bregman, your leverage decreases in, in a Bohm trade. And I don't even know what fair value for Bohm would be. I mean, that's the other part of this is that it only makes sense if you're getting, you know, substance back for him, because if all you do is replace Bohm with Bregman, okay, you got a little better. You got much better defensively. Right. Like maybe got a little bit better offensively, but Bohm's still a really good hitter. He's still a guy who hits to all fields, 40 plus doubles, two years in a row, he's near to hundred RBIs. And it's just, you know, I, we don't know every single thing that happens behind closed doors. We don't know all the conversations that took place between Rob Thompson and Alec Bohm or the coaching staff and Alec Bohm. And we don't know like the depths of some of the attitude issues, if there, if that really was what the, the big thing was with Bohm down the stretch. But 
it still remains surprising to me that he is almost becoming like one of the scapegoats here when he has the offensive profile that this team claims to want. Um, but again, it just kind of speaks to needing to push this thing forward somehow, needing to find a way to increase like the offensive ceiling and prevent what's happened the last two Octobers. Exactly. And it, when that rumor kind of came out, I think what AJ Brzezinski came out with the rumor that, you know, the Phillies weren't too happy with Bohm's attitude. Um, to be honest, man, I, there was someone that works for our office here that, that was kind of talking about that all season. And, um, you know, was being told that it wasn't a great look. The Phillies were kind of getting tired of it. Rob Thompson was kind of, you know, also getting tired of it, had multiple conversations with Alec Bohm of, you know, but like you said, we don't know what those conversations were. Um, and to see his name kind of pop up. My question to you then, too, we'll, I'll ask you, the, and then I, got, I want something to say here about Bregman and Bohm real quick. I guess we'll go with that. I uh, saw a stat kind of comparing postseason numbers, right? Um, since 2022, Bregman, 115 plate appearances, seven home runs, 18 RBIs, 13 walks, 16 Ks, a 270 average, and a 925 OPS. Compared to Bohm over the last two postseasons, 132 plate appearances, two home runs, 14 RBIs, a 214 average, and a 629 OPS. We know that Bregman... Um, has showed up for the Astros over the last, what, seven, six, seven years in the postseason. Um, he has that experience. So that could be a big factor because we were kind of disappointed to see Alec kind of fall off. Obviously, he gets benched in game two of the NLDS. Um, and, you know, but like you said, man, he, he's an all-star. He was leading the team in, in, in RBIs for a while there. He had a great season. Um, and then it was almost like that Kansas City series um, went over and just didn't look like himself. And ever since that series in Kansas City, kind of kind of fell off. I was actually just talking to some buddies, though. That's the question I want to ask, dude. And you kind of alluded to it here five, ten minutes ago. Um, what would be the return for Boom? Would it be major league players? Would it be prospects? What's your opinion on that? Well, it would be something that would help the Phillies now. Like, right. you know, e even if it's prospects, it would be prospects that would then allow the Phillies to turn around and make a trade involving maybe those prospects or some of their own to get a, a, a win now player. Like, I don't think they would trade Bohm and just, you know, get three young minor leaguers back that could one day, you know, two or three years down the road, help them. Like that wouldn't really serve any purpose. In my opinion, yeah. um, you would be looking for like a comparable player who is in the outfield or maybe is a reliever. Um, and what I mean by comparable player, I'm talking about comparable player in terms of what he gives you on the field, but also in terms of, you know, like the, the point they're at in their career, like Bohm isn't yet a free agent. You know, he's still do, going through the arbitration process. He's not a free agent until 2027. So, you know, you, you don't want to trade a guy like that for a rental player. And look, the Phillies might come away from this offseason not even trading Bohm. We're talking about that right now because it's been the, you know, the, the talk around baseball. And it's not even just like the talk around baseball nationally. I can tell you that locally at the end of the season, like it, it it's not like A.J. Pierzynski broke any news when he said that the Phillies were um, had issues with the way the boom was like handling himself on the field. There was a lot of the throwing of helmets, the spiking of helmets, the frustration after outs. Uh, it's just bad body language. And, and you don't want to show the other team that you're like losing uh, your composure. And that's what I think the Phillies were most um, upset about with him is that like, don't let them see you sweat. And toward the end of the year, he was letting them see him sweat. Uh, in yeah. terms of the return, I, it's something that's going to help them win now, whether it's a one-for-one -one player swap or a, a package of prospects that allows them to turn around and make a trade. You mentioned the postseason numbers with Bregman. Obviously, that's one area where you're hoping that if, if you make that move, if you trade Bohm, sign Bregman, that you're hoping that's somewhere where the, like the difference shows up. But the other part of it is that you know Bohm's 28 years old, and the Phillies have gotten – solid enough defense out of him the last few years, ever since that that game against the Mets, the famous I hate this place game, right? So ever since then, Bohm has been an adequate defender, maybe slightly below average, but not a guy who's killing you. The thing is, is that these might be the best years of his career in terms of athleticism and defense, right? Because it just happens. Like as players get older, their range slips a little bit, their defense slips a little bit. I, you know, even like Nolan Arenado, one of the greatest of all time, is not the same defender that he was at 28, you know? Yeah. So if you get out from under Bohm now, you're avoiding like the most expensive years of him. Plus, you might be avoiding like the worst defensive years. I think that could be a component of it as well. But it all just comes down to uh needing to like figure out a creative way to improve the team because this would have sounded crazy in the middle of the season when Bohm was right. on pace for 115 RBIs and looked like one of their best hitters. He started in the all-star game. Um, but, you know, tough decisions need to be made. And I think that was really like the theme of that uh, end of season press conference with Dave Dombrowski was that this time around, 
you're not holding on to everybody because they all get along. Like you got to do what you got to do. You know, if yeah. you can, if it, if it involves saying goodbye to a popular player in your clubhouse, so be it. Because what makes you really popular is winning the World Series. Exactly. And and that's what everyone was kind of concerned about. You know, even at the trade deadline, remember, it was kind of like, well, who are they going to give up? Are they going to give up a big piece? Someone that, that's crucial to this locker room to go get a bigger fish. And I, that's a great point, dude. I think Dave and Rob Thompson both made that known where and that end of the season press conference like hey you know it's it we we talked about the window i don't know if the window is necessarily closing i think there's at least maybe two or three years but it's it's slowly but surely getting close to closing um and if you need to break some guys up you know then that's what then you know that's what happens but um it's interesting to see man and 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 i guess with bregman too obviously he's only 30 let me just interrupt you would you do um and i don't even know if this is like you know even in the realm of possibility but yeah would you do Alec Bone for Garrett Crochet? I mean, the Phillies have shown interest in Garrett Crochet at, at the trade deadline this past season, and it seems like they're going to be one of the teams that go after him this winter. And the White Sox have talked about wanting players who can contribute right away, and they need offense. And I'm sure that a package of prospects makes more sense with, given their timeline, but that's the kind of move where you're trading him and you're improving at another position. All of a sudden, now you don't have to worry about a fifth starter. Now you take a guy and you use basically the equivalent of your number two or your number three. So, I mean, what do you think about something like that? I, I don't mind it. I would, I would be down for it. Um, I know there's, there's like some rumors that were being talked about with like Bohm and Rojas for crochet. Again, I don't know if that would be a thing or, you know, maybe even throwing Luis Robert in there, who knows? Um, but yeah, I mean, according to Heyman, right. I think he came out and said that the Dodgers, Phillies, Orioles, and Mets are the four teams right now in on crochet. Um, uh, I'm I'm okay with that, man, because obviously that fifth starting spot has come back and bit them in the butt the last two or three years. And if you solidify a two or three, depending, you know, Wheeler, Nola, Crochet, Ranger, Christopher Sanchez, that's a heck of a rotation, and you don't have to worry about that fifth starting spot. So and it, also, a, it also protects you in case you can't work out an extension with Ranger, right? It's not just go. about now. It's about, okay, you have a, you have a guy who – a, might be better than Ranger Suarez long-term, probably will be better than Ranger Suarez over the next five years, protects you in case you lose him. Maybe it also enables you to dangle Ranger Suarez on the trade market. These are all just thoughts. We're not saying that this is going to happen, but um, the Phillies have some players who are going to generate interest on the trade market and can help them kind of reconfigure this roster. That's why I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, I'm really fascinated by this offseason. Everywhere I go, doctor's office, Wawa, anywhere I go, <laughs> when people ask me, what do you think is going to happen this offseason? I just say, I think that there's going to be um, some unexpected activity uh, in terms of trades. You know, we've seen the Phillies spend a ton of money the last five years in in off seasons. But I'll tell you, I'm excited to get to down to Dallas uh, in December for the winter meetings to see what unfolds for the Phillies there. Uh, you know, Juan Soto is obviously the big name, and the Phillies. John Middleton made a comment. He was at the University of Pennsylvania a few weeks ago um, at a, at a like a symposium, and interesting the, the Daily <laughs> Pennsylvanian. Um, they had some of his comments. Uh, he was asked about Juan Soto, and he said that he kind of figured, paraphrasing here, but Middleton was saying that he figures the Phillies are not going to be the favorites, but he doesn't mind being a stalking horse. That was his quote. Um, you know, with Soto, obviously he is such a perfect fit for the Phillies, and yeah. obviously he's going to get like five hundred plus million dollars, maybe six hundred million dollars. Yeah. Ugh. For me, the hurdle just seems to be not the Phillies' ability to spend that money; it's their ability to win a bidding war with the Yankees and Mets. Because the Yankees, like Brian Cashman and the Steinbrenner, they are not going to be able to live that down if Juan Soto walks away from them after what they saw, what he did for them, transforming them from a pretty good team to a legitimate World Series contender in one year, right? Yep. So they need to re-sign him every bit as much as they needed to re-sign Aaron Judge two years ago. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is if you're the Mets, you have, a, you have the opportunity to add the best free agent, one of the best hitters in baseball, and steal him away from the Crosstown Yankees and you have by far the richest owner, right? So, like, I just don't see a world where the Phillies can beat out that sort of bidding war. Uh, the Red Sox have also met with Soto. The Blue Jays are in on him after losing out on Shohei Otani. So, I don't see it happening. Uh, I, I know Phillies fans are still dreaming, but uh, how are you feeling about it? <laughs> <laughs> Phillies fans and myself also just dreaming. Our good buddy Jordan Hall every day. Um, the, our good buddy Flyers reporter uh, does a great job every day. Text me Soto question mark. I'm like, dude, I, I wish, right? It's it would be incredible, dude. I think I'm with you. It's it's one. It's a dream, right? It's it'd be fantastic if they can somehow, you know, 
pull this off but dude even if it's like 600 650 which that's what it's kind of sounded like like you said man and and with the otani contract right that's the deferred money i don't know if any of this money will be deferred it's it's a weird contract situation where it comes down to you know if otani was getting all that money deferred and all of a sudden it's like what soto is actually going to get destroyed <laughs> and how about this too i know that like okay i know that guys care more about winning than everything else and you know you'd make an exception if it means getting juan soto but like Say it takes six hundred million dollars, right? Yeah. And you're Bryce Harper, and you sign for three thirty. And there's a guy in your same team making six hundred. It's one thing if he's making twenty million more or fifty million more, but if he's making double what you're making, and the money's not the, you know, that's I think that's probably a conversation for a different day. But we've we've had that conversation, man. Yeah. Like where it's like if you're Bryce, one the whole extension right is still on the table. If Bryce does get extended and all of a sudden you go out, yes, they have the relationship. Trey Turner, Kyle Schwarber, they all have the re relationship. Kevin Long, they've all had the relationship in Washington with Juan Soda. If I'm Bryce Harper, man, you're the face of this team and you go out, like you said, and you double that money, I don't know how you'd feel. I don't I don't know how I would feel. Well, he would be happy like, because it would make them the World Series favorite. Uh, for sure. Within the National League. But like, I just Personally. Think that, I think <laughs> that like after the dust would settle on something like yeah. that, and then you'd look at your situation, you're like, okay, you know, I'm making 20 5.3 a year and this guy's making 50 a year and his total is double line but so i just another reason yeah. why i just um but aside I from guess. soto aside from soto do any of these other free agents do anything for you in terms of like tyler o'neill jerkson profar anthony santander teoscar hernandez those would be the four best corner outfielders after soto and as i said santander and teoscar have qualifying offers attached to them as does soto right i dude i'm telling you I would love Tony Taters. I would love Anthony Santander, especially after the the season that he just had. Um, it was one of those one of those seasons where it was like, oh, he had another home run and, and whatever he, he finished with forty plus. Um, that would be amazing. I would love Santander, but like you said, the qualifying offer could be tough. Obviously, Baltimore, another disappointing season for them. Um, you know, they're looking at if they lose Corbin Burns, they could go out and get Max Freed. There's a lot of interesting conversation there, but I would love Santander, man. Um, it, it would just be tough. But even like, I don't know, like a guy like Tyler O'Neill, someone that could be, you know, a DH sometimes. I don't know. But that's a guy that he's 32 or 30, comma, two. Um, it would be cool. But I did, to be honest, man, I think right now in terms of free agents, not even corner outfielders, and maybe this is a good transition, um, a guy like Blake Trinan, right? Um, get him for a one-year deal. Obviously, a little up there in age. The Dodgers obviously just won a World Series, so it could be tough. But somebody like Blake, Blake Trinan to solidify um, this bullpen would be fantastic. He's He's been so good for the Dodgers over the last few years because I feel like Tanner Scott, um, he's going to be wanting a lot of money. And obviously, the, the big fish that the Phillies have to worry about right now is bringing back Jeff Hoffman. Um, that's kind of my number one checklist, to be honest, uh, for the Phillies this offseason. But... When it comes down to somebody that I really would like, Blake Trinan might be there. Because you could get him for, what, one year, maybe 10 mil, 12 mil, if you wanted to? Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. What are your opinions on the, on the bullpen? Well... You know, relievers don't jump on one-year deals. You probably need to give a guy like that a two-year offer or a one yeah. with a player option or something like that it, just to entice him to sign early. I mean, if not, you're going to be waiting around, and guys like that don't really have any, like, um, big impetus to sign unless the right offer materializes. I think Tanner Scott, if I were to choose who the most ideal right-handed reliever free agent to add would be this offseason, I probably would pick Tanner Scott. He was so dominant last year and really just helped – take the Padres up another level when they acquired him. Uh, Jeff Hoffman would be next on my list. Like I have Jeff Hoffman, for example, clearly ahead of Clay Holmes, the Yankees closer, who's a free agent. I, and I say that's just from watching both guys a lot. Like Jeff Hoffman, the last two seasons has been a lot more reliable than Clay Holmes, even though Holmes is also pitching in a high leverage role in a high leverage city. Um, but in terms of like relief uh, rankings, I would probably have Scott one. I'd have Jeff Hoffman two. I'd probably have Carlos Estevez three. Um, yeah. I know that he was Estevez didn't miss as many bats as you would have thought for a guy who was an upper nineties fastball. And there were some like signs of a uh, little, some signs of worry there late in the season, but still overall in the totality of what he's done the last two, three years, I like what Estevez gave them. Kirby Yates is a free agent. He had a good year with the Rangers. You mentioned Blake Trinan. Um, 
do think the Phillies are going to add a couple relievers and Hoffman, you know, there's also this, these reports about Hoffman teams potentially giving him an opportunity to start, which yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but may, that's something that may force interested parties to boost their offers a little bit. Who, who knows? Um, getting what back, to the, getting back to the outfielders real quick. I, I'll just say that those yeah, guys, right. like yeah. those guys like Santander, Santander, 40 plus homer year. Uh, I look at him the same way I look at Willie Adamas. I don't want to be the team that pays them this offseason. I don't want to be yeah. the team. When I say I, I don't mean the Phillies. I mean, like, if I'm running a front office, <clears throat> I don't want to be the team that signs Willie Adamas to, like, $120 million or whatever it's going to take. Like six years. Yeah. Or, or Santander, because I just don't have confidence that those guys are going to be able to do what they did in 2024 two more times. You know, maybe they can do it, like, one more time. I just – I, they haven't done it enough in their careers, and that's why just like a team that has as many expenditures as the Phillies do, if you give out another nine-figure contract, you better be certain that it's the right guy, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And this region class, the big. yeah, this region class, I feel like there's not that type of guy, right? Like besides Soto, there's not a type of guy that you're going to go give, you know, like you said, a, a long-term contract, especially in, in the uh, nine-figure range. But Well, uh, like Alex Bregman, I think you would. I mean, Bregman's th- – so he's 30 – he's 31. 30. Yeah, yeah, he's 30, right? So he'll play next yeah. year at 31. He's only two years older than Boehm. You know, he's not as much older as, than you might think. Um, Which is crazy, right? Because I, it was one of those where you looked at that, and I was like, dude, he's got to be like 34. Like, no. he's been playing for so long, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, no, he's only 30. Okay. And it's ironic that, you know, it's Bregman we're talking about because I remember like turning to people in the press box this season and saying like, because we were talking about the upcoming free Asian class and Bregman strikes me as the kind of guy where like he's a big name, he's going to get a huge contract. He's not as good offensively as people might think. Like he's, there was the one year where he was absolutely incredible where he hit like, I I can't even remember the numbers off the top of my head, but he hit like 330, he had like 10 war that year. I think that was the year that the Astros had sign stealing. So that year, Bregman hit 296, 41 homers. He's never hit more than 31 any other year. His OPS that year was 1015. Uh, every year since it's been 820 or below. It's the all-around package, though. It's kind of similar yeah. to like when you sign JT Real Muto. You're getting the all-around package. He's not going to wow you uh, with the batting average or with the OPS, but when you look up at the end of the year, he's done enough for you. He's he's hit in clutch moments. And, you know, a guy like that is worth, to me, nine figures um, and would help the Phillies out a lot. It just depends on what else they can do this offseason. Um, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of hot stove chatter both in the next few weeks, the next few months, uh, in the more immediate future here, we're just yeah, about we're just about to see these awards uh, announcements come out. So we've seen that the Phillies had uh, Bryce Harper won a Silver Slugger. He was on the All MLB Second Team. Uh, the Phillies were shut out in Gold Glove awards. <laughs> no Gold Glove for Harper, Stott, Zach Wheeler, or uh, who was the other guy? Who was Marshy. Not- yeah, Brandon Marsh. That's right. Because Ian Happ, Ian Happ one is like ace straight or something ridiculous. Dude. And so <laughs> now, I mean, the big one for the Phillies is Cy Young, right? It's like yeah. Wheeler's one of three finalists along with um, – with uh, Chris Sale and Paul Skeens. Skeens is a nice story. He's not going to win, so it's really just Sale and Wheeler. What do you think? Did that shock you when you saw Skeens in there? You know, it surprised me at first, but then you go right. back and you look at the numbers. They were just absurd. Yeah. yeah, like when I when I got the final, it was I like looked at my phone and was like, oh, like holy cow, man! In his first year, he's a and it was twenty two starts. I mean, it wasn't as if it was a half season. That's like three quarters of a season. So. Exactly, exactly. I was, I was still shocked. I was like, oh man, that's pretty, pretty awesome for Paul. But and also, yeah. also real quick, the, the way yeah, that, I'm pretty sure the way the finalists are revealed, it's like those are the guys who appeared on the ballots the most. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's like that. I don't think it's like anybody saying, you know what, Paul Skeens is the third best pitcher. I think it's just based on the way that the voting shook out. So anyway. for sure, and and like you, you mentioned it before for. I don't know, man. For a lot of people that don't know, you obviously you vote, um, not you personally, but you you did have a vote, but for MVP. But you vote before the season ends, right? A week before the season ends. Well, no, the ballots come out like the final week of the season. You just need to have yours in by the final day. But like I think a lot of people start, you know, filling theirs out in that final week if they have their minds made up. Um, But but I I, 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 yeah, I I wrote that though in my article the other day at, at NBC Sports Philadelphia was that good plug. Uh, yeah, but that in the Cy Young race, like if you filled out your ballot three days before the season ended, that might end up making a difference because Huge. the final day of the regular season was a doubleheader between the Braves and the Mets where it was a must win for both teams. And Chris Sale had been like scratched a couple times leading up to that and then was scratched yep. again on the final day of the regular season. I, you know, yeah, I don't think it's too outlandish this conspiracy theory that like i think the braves were kind of softening whatever was going on with chris sale there there down the stretch a to like limit the amount of information other teams had would be to like help continue to boost his cy young candidacy right yeah uh and if you voted 
after that final day with the knowledge that Sale wasn't available for the final two weeks of the season when the Braves needed him, maybe that skews your vote. I don't know. 100%. Especially in because he was scheduled to start that game two of that doubleheader where it was a must win for the Braves. <laughs> and obviously he didn't show up. And obviously, dude, and that's the thing. All respect to Chris Sale. Um, the comeback, dude, I said, if there's like a comeback player of the year award, give it to him, right? Um, for what he's been through in Boston, uh, to come back and sign with Atlanta and look like the old Chris Sale. Um, it was really cool to see. And just respect to Chris Sale and everything like that. But you know where my alliance is, man. Um, Zach Wheeler, just every single game, dude. It was just any every start. You're like, all right, this is a win for the Phils. And whether it was seven innings, six innings, but it was, it was always one or two runs, but four hits, 10 Ks. And the one thing that stood out to me all the time, especially when I was making the game stories and stuff, right? It was like, I'd always look. And he went on that stretch there where he didn't allow a walk. It was almost dang near every start where he didn't allow a walk. Then he had like four walks in that Mets game, um, which was a little uncharacteristic. But I mean, if you go around team MVP, I think this year was Zach Wheeler. Um, you could ar argue Kyle Schwarber, Nick Castellanos, um, even Bryce, maybe to a point. But it was just every start, man. And especially with the injuries of Ranger, um, Christopher Sanchez, which was unbelievable, kind of didn't really necessarily fall off, but had a very consistent season. Nola obviously was Mr. Consistency as well. But every single time that Zach Wheeler took the mound, I felt confident that it was going to be a Phillies win. And that goes to show that, you know, he should be the best pitcher in the National League. And we talked about it before. He got robbed two years ago. I really hope he doesn't get robbed this year. But, you know, every every sign is kind of pointing that Chris Sale is going to win it. But um, if I had a vote, dude, it would Zach Wheeler. And 100%. Give it to him, man. He's been so, so consistent. And you and I have had this conversation as well. Obviously... He gets a lot of recognition here in Philadelphia. I feel like he doesn't get a lot of recognition, especially when, like, I saw when MLB tweeted out all the finalists. There's people that were like, Zach Wheeler, like, who? Not, not necessarily, but, you know, like, it's probably the bots on Twitter and all that stuff. But I feel like he doesn't get the recognition nationally that he should. Um, he is just unreal, man. And we, uh, we're we lucky to have him. And I know the debate has come down to, is he possibly the best free agent signing that Phillies might ever had? Obviously, if Bryce Harper goes down um, in history as well. But you could argue Zach Wheeler could be the best free agent signing the Phillies ever had. Um, yeah, no doubt. They just got to get a ring here. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I do think that nationally, the, he is getting the attention finally at this point, just because he's done it in the playoffs now every year. It's not yeah. even just like it's become just like a, a, a no brainer it's that Zach Wheeler is going to go out there and give you six shutout innings or six innings of one run ball in dominant fashion uh, come October. But um, in turn, you, you mentioned that he was the, you think he's the Phillies team MVP. I agree. I, I, I voted for MVP and I had both sale and Wheeler. I think I had them fifth and sixth on my MVP ballot, which Love it. that's not always the case. You don't always have pitchers that high on the ballot. But when I, when I was doing my, like rankings this year, I had Shohei Otani first. I had Ketel Marte second, Francisco Lindor third. Uh, that might piss off some Mets fans again. I I did it, I think, two days before the season ended. So, like, again, if I waited until Lindor hit that mammoth home run uh, to send the Mets to the playoffs, maybe that would have catapulted him to second over Marte. But anyway, um, but I had uh, both Sale and Wheeler there because after you got past those first three guys, you could argue that they were as impactful as any position player, you know. And, People sometimes say, okay, pitchers only, you know, play one fifth of the games starting pitchers. How can they make as much of an impact? But if you look at like the total at bats that they're a part of, they're a part of as many at bats as a position player is throughout the course of a full season. Like a Zach Wheeler's facing 700 hitters total, the way that a, a position player is taking 700 plate appearances. But I agree with sales, the front runner. He has the narrative on his back that he's never won one. He's been the stud pitcher his whole career. Although when you start to like add up the accol like the accolades and the where these guys are on the leaderboards, okay, Sale led the NL in wins and an ERA, and he and in strikeouts. He had one more strikeout than Wheeler. Wheeler had 26 quality starts, which led the NL. He led the NL with a .96 whip. He had the lowest opponent's batting average, the lowest opponent's on base percentage, the lowest opponent's slugging percentage. So he has just as many feathers in his cap as Sale has in his. And I, I would think that the workload difference down the stretch had to impact the race somewhat in the in the minds of some voters that Wheeler ended up with, what, 25 more innings than Sale? And that's yep. the one of four or five starts. That's the exactly. an extra month of baseball. Um and he did it against Burns too. He had he had way more innings than Burns in 2021. 46, yeah, 46. Yeah. And, and like if that happened again, Wheeler would win because now yeah. it's almost like people had like a 
two year, like f- not two year, like a five year period where people went crazy and thought innings didn't matter. You know, right. like, uh, don't get me started it's on crazy. that. Like, yeah. now, now it's like, it's like it, now it's like the, it's course corrected. Like it went too far one way. Now it's course corrected. I just wonder if that's enough for Wheeler to win it this year. I hope he does. Uh, the announcement is going to be next Wednesday, November 20th. Yep. And, and dude, we were looking at the resume that the Phillies sent out too. I was looking at this right now. Finished strong over his last 11 starts, basically August to the end of the season. He went six and two with a 1.89 year ahead. Then what he had, he went at least six innings and allowed two earned or fewer in all of those 11 starts, which is the longest streak by any MLB pitcher this season and the longest by any Phillies pitcher starting since at least 1893, dude. Yeah, he was like, their, and he was their stopper when they needed him to be because you remember they were not playing well for a bulk of that second half. They had like one really hot three week stretch in the second half, and other than that, it was like pretty much miserable for the Phillies in the second half. Yeah. Just imagine if they weren't getting the, the ace level production out of Zach Wheeler, what that might have looked like, dude. And and what and right here again, following a Phillies loss in the final sixteen starts of the season, a Phillies loss, Wheeler posted a two four five ERA with one hundred fourteen strikeouts and twenty six walks. In his final six starts of the season, following a Phillies loss. He posted a 1-5-2 ERA. So immediately after a loss in that fifth rotation spot, he came back and came through. I mean, again, just put his team on the back, like you said, man. And it, it, well, you, know. Can you imagine if he picked the White Sox all those years ago when the White Sox <laughs> they offered him more money, apparently, and he oh. chose the Phillies. What a what a thank thing goodness one you can make. Well, <laughs> that's gonna do it for this Phillies talk podcast. There's the Wheeler news coming out midweek next week. We'll keep you apprised of all the Phillies um, news and rumors here on the Phillies Talk Podcast. He is Spencer McCurcher. I'm Corey Seidman. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend, everybody.